Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. That's right. Your watch, your iPhone, your clock. If you got a clock is correct, it's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, success. Of course, a lot more things. A lot of things are going to come up, but those are the things that inspire us, drive us, inform us. Of course, I'm happy to have my co-host, co-producer here, Jim McCarthy. We love his time and talent. Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. What's up, buddy? Oh, you know, the same old, same old, just uh, podcasting away all the time. Well, yeah, you have your... Uh, many podcasts that you do, and you're producing about 20 of them. And you got back from New York. Your daughter sang at Carnegie Hall. Tell us about this. She was, uh, you know, chosen to and nominated and accepted to be part of a choir performance on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, it was very interesting to kind of watch. It was Courtney and I went both went up and, uh, you know, we, uh, here's the the state of affairs of society in which we live, because it's like, <laughs> okay, I hope that I hope this isn't a trafficking effort. Uh, so we got to the whole place, the hotel, and saw instruments and ballrooms. I'm like, okay, this is legit. This is good. It's not like they're sourcing children for other things. So that was uh, that was a nice thing, and um, it was really cool because the conductor uh, of one of the um, choirs uh, is a conductor and a director at Belmont. Oh, small world! And yeah. Yeah. My goodness, you want to talk about? a moving performance like brought us to tears well you had to be very very proud congratulations yeah oh yeah very nice buddy well hey i know you're excited for many reasons but you know we're huge fans of this band this drummer it's a special day today's guest hailing originally from sacramento california and since 1979 the drummer and founding member of the grammy award-winning pop rock band huey lewis and the news our friend bill gibson Bill, welcome to the show. How are yeah. you, man? Uh, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> this is great. So you're joining us from your uh, home studio somewhere in Marin County there? That's correct, yeah. Fantastic, man. Well, we're so excited to have this uh, chat because, I mean, I'm a fan from way back. Jim and I are already men of a certain age, so we grew up on the MTV. It was like music videos 24 hours a day this will never work it worked for quite some time and you know we love the djs uh martha quinn nina blackwood she's gargled with razor blades jj jackson i'm sure you got pretty chummy with these guys but we got to see your videos all day once an hour every day for years so to be talking to you this is a real thrill oh thank you man yeah that was mtv was huge for us because obviously we like we were one of the first bands on mtv and uh, like you say they pumped us you know relentlessly for a few years there and uh that really helped us out you know that was that was a huge bus boost for sure yeah and uh you know at the time you know i was doing a lot of air drumming and it was great what a great person to model yourself after because you are uh an educated drummer, a trained drummer, an informed drummer. You got great hands, a great feel. Your tracks are all just like perfect. They're super clean, studio friendly, but it's from the waist down. It doesn't sound academic. Everything's perfect. And we were talking about um, shuffles, like off camera. We were talking about shuffles and how Jim is trying to get his butt into a Huey Lewis tribute band he's trying to dethrone the current drummer because he's just such a big fan of you guys and they're like all right man you know know the material but you got to realize that it's shuffles we audition on the shuffles because no one could play triplets anymore why there's no leroy big bad leroy browns on the radio anymore it's all Mm -hmm. straight eighth so there's no songs on the radio anymore it's like you know yeah it's one just one chord and a half one naked chord with a three note melody that repeats itself 50 times <laughs> and what the hell can you get out of that i know we're sounding like <laughs> get off my lawn You're, he's not wrong though rich i mean no, i on. know but you guys were pulling you guys were pulling from hitsville usa motown stacks you know the country and everything is in there r and yeah. blue eyed soul big band yeah. Um, the blues, rock and roll, you know, and we all know. Yeah, it's. Mm-hmm. it's- hey, can I, can I cut you in on a dirty little secret? Heck yeah, drum sure. roll. I'm as untrained as I could possibly be. I, I, I'm self-taught. What? I would never think that. 
I did hear that about you. I'm a self-taught player. Oh. Um, I have recently, uh, when COVID hit in two, 2020, I started taking lessons, and I'm still taking lessons. Who are you and, studying with? Uh, Henrique de Almeida. I don't know if you know Henrique. Oh. He's, uh, he was the chair of the drone department of Berkeley for about 12 years. Gotcha. He's a Brazilian guy, just a phenomenal human being and a great player. And I, I'm, I'm, he has reinstored the passion for drumming that I had when I first started. Wow. So I'm practicing. Now I practice probably two to four hours a day. Wow. And, and uh, I'm back. I'm in the studio every day uh, and I'm playing a lot. And it's uh, it's the best thing that's happened to me in years. Was there a period there where you were like, um, oh, my God, I got to play um, Power Love again. And there's just like a little bit of, you know, I just I've been playing in the same band for 24 years. I mean, we're we got to. We got to play Hicktown, man. The kids want the song, right? So <laughs> sometimes there is a period where you're just like, all right, that's the job is the execution. Yeah, you know? That's 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 exactly right. And, and um, you know, that's what they know you as. And so that's what you have to be for them. Yeah. So, um, yeah that's dead right. So what is he? So does he, are you working on your hands? Like page one of the stick control book, page 38 of the syncopation book, or you're working on your Samba partido alto all day long. What's right now, doing? right now I'm working on metric modulations with, oh. uh, with, um, Weckl threes in the kick drum, you know, the left, left, right, right, left, right, right, left, right, right. Ah. And then, and then a one, and then it's a shuffle. If you play it one, two, three, four with your left, with your left foot. I don't know if you could hear that. No, but it looks great. Uh, so it's on. <laughs> oh, yes. So it's one, two, three, four. That's a shuffle. But if it's in a one, two, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three. And then, then you've, and I'm working on that and soloing over that and stuff. Ooh. So just stuff that I, 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 I didn't take the time to learn when I was young. And I knew that if I never did, I would regret it. Wow. You know, I, I just knew I was going to regret not taking the time to figure out the technique and the math behind it because drumming is all math. As we know, it's all subdivision. So, you know, um, if I, I just told myself, you know, you, 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 you never studied with it. You, you never studied with a teacher. You never took the time to learn that, that uh, theory and te technique and all that stuff. And I, I would regret it if I didn't. So I'm doing it. Amazing. So you're Good doing you. it in this particular chapter of your life. Yeah, man. So, yeah. so for the non drummers out there, um, what Bill is kind of saying is that a shuffle rhythm would be like dun da dun da dun da dun da one la la da da three la la four la la triple la triple la triple. But he's I'm dug it together, get dug it together, get dug it together, get dug it together. Three note grouping, cycling over a quarter note, and it takes. Let me see how long it takes to resolve. Dug it together, get 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 dug it thick. If you add one more sixteenth, oh, three measures. Gotcha. Three bars. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so do the guys give you a drum solo? Was that ever a thing when you guys were yeah. in the year? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. You you can find a couple of them on YouTube. I know that we we were in Germany once, uh playing that show Rock Palast in uh in Germany. And uh they gave me a drum solo and I, yeah, I, I used to take drum solos on and off. You know, I, I wasn't really that comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do it that often. But I you know, I, I had my fun. Yeah. That's awesome. And you've been a Yamaha artist for a very long time. And that was as yeah. always, that's, you know, I'm a, I've been with DW and I'll be with DW probably to the day I die. But my, one of my little secret, you know, passions, like an instrument that really floats my boat is, is a lot of that Yamaha, the recording costumes, the maple costumes. That's what I played before I played, you know, way, actually I'm staring at a, a cherry red Weckl mullet uh recording Most. custom kit from like 1985 <laughs> or something across the room it's not set up but i got it and it was just i don't know it's just a collecting thing that i like yeah no that was my first kit from yamaha was a, a quartz gray recording custom kit with the big deep toms you know yeah. and now what i'm playing now is is the new recording custom kit which is they made for me which is just best drum set i've ever owned man is it you know smaller toms yeah mm -hmm. just what a great sound, great sounding kit. Yeah, I've been with them 40, 40 years this year, I think. Or no, I 40 love. years. 
That's yeah. great. You're a loyal. You're a loyal endorser. You're not flying. I am. To the new I'm, a loyal, uh, I'm a loyal Zildjian endorser as well. Yeah, I mean that's a lot of lineage there. Four hundred years. Wow. Yeah. You yeah. Know? They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Your presidencies. Yeah. <laughs> Just a couple of presidencies. Yeah. So even even before the presidencies ever started. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Before so, the rock. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, speaking of that swing feel, that, that elusive shuffle feel. Yeah. Um, you were saying off camera, your dad was a frustrated jazz musician. So what 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 happened there? How did how did the music bug start for you? Did he push you into the deep end of the pool, or was just kind of was he encouraging? How did it how did it all happen? There was music going at my house twenty four hours a day. My my mom was the um, director of the church choir. We had church choir practice in our living room. Mm -hmm. She would play the piano and the church would practice. My dad would come home from work and immediately put on Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers yeah. or Basie or Duke Ellington or Miles Davis. So we always had, and my mom loved Broadway musicals. So I not only had church music going, I had Broadway musicals. I had big band jazz. I was really Technically, I would say I, I heard more big band jazz than anyone should ever have to listen to, mm -hmm. to you know, due to my father. Yeah. And uh, so I was just raised on jazz and, and music of all genres. And I loved it. I just I ate it up. I, wa I wanted to be um, I wanted to be a saxophone player. Matter of fact, I was seven. Se yeah, seven years old. And I was watching Lawrence Welk one Sunday afternoon and he had that five piece sax section that was just silk smooth. Yeah. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to play saxophone. So I went to my school band and I said, I want to play saxophone. And the guy and the band instructor said, okay, great. Here, you take this instrument home. And he gave me a clarinet and he said, it's the same mouthpiece. So take this home and get used to the embouchure. So I took that home. I started playing, but I'm, now I'm playing the clarinet. I'm going, this isn't a saxophone. It does not sound the same, you know? <laughs> so I, so it kind of put me off that, but I, however, I stuck with clarinet for three or four years. Then my father took a job in San Francisco as an architect at the port of San Francisco. Hmm. And, uh, and um, we moved to Mill Valley in 1961, well, right before the British invasion and the Beach Boys hit and everything. And so now I'm growing up in Marin County uh, and uh, uh, it just exploded. It just absolutely exploded. And I, I you know, but I, I just took it from there. I was very, like, very I, healthy I time. It, yeah, I could not get enough of music of all kinds were you sitting you in front the of the first... television uh in, in 1964 uh for the that beatles oh, yeah. and you... sullivan show yeah oh yeah yeah i went to see the my my parents took me to see the beatles twice and when oh, wow. well like most parents would you're going to see the beatles over my dead body they were telling my friends you know no way in 64 rock and roll was abu man you couldn't hear it on tv commercials you couldn't hear it anywhere except for on the radio and and most parents were a dead set against it mm -hmm. so uh, i was very lucky that both my parents were musical and they actually liked the beatles so i said yeah we'll take you and your sister to go see the beatles no problem so i, I got to see them twice that's and awesome I remember, <laughs> here's a great story for you i remember <laughs> I remember my dad took me and a couple of friends to see the dave clark five at the cow palace in 64 and I was 13 and uh, Dave Clark's up there. You know, you, I, you know, Dave Clark, uh, the Dave Clark five, I'm sure. sure. Yeah. And he was just very simple. You know, he just great looking guy, you know, woman killer, super handsome. And he just <laughs> sit up there and smile and go, boom, boom, oh. boom, boom, boom. And my dad hits me in the short. He goes, see what that guy's doing. He says, you can do that. He says he should, he, he's a carpenter. He's just hammering nails up there. You can do that. And I, I and he, he gave me all the confidence I ever needed. So did my mom. That's, That's awesome. amazing. That's great. Jim, my what were you going like, to say? My mom was like, it's almost like the opposite thing. I, I wanted to play the drums since I was six or seven years old because of MTV. I would see these guys playing and I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys were the part of the trifecta of albums that were what started my musical love it was Van Halen, 1984, 
um, Huey Lewis and the New Sports. I had my my my. I think it was my ninth birthday. I got a boombox, and the other album, maybe unfortunately, was the Ghostbusters soundtrack. I apologize, but you know I couldn't help. But I didn't know what you know all the things that played out after that. But anyway, um, I, I said I always wanted to play the drums, and my mom got me a saxophone. You know what? That's crazy <laughs> that we all have the saxophone in common because right. I love the saxophone, man. Ah, I mean, read the room. It Dude. really does. It, it, it's it's a great instrument, but man, she she's like, I just don't want the noise. My mom was from the Bronx, uh, and then she, bad, they're too noisy. And you know, I'd be like, you know, okay, but uh, saxophones any better for crying out loud with squeaky notes and everything? Come oh, on, yeah. I mean. And then finally, when I was like twelve years old, they got me the seventy five dollar drum set, and it's you know that's all she wrote. Yeah, so, yeah, great, amazing. I'm self taught as well. Well, you finally got there, though, yeah, Jim. I finally, <laughs> well, <laughs> finally. I mean, all adverse. <laughs> I mean, my thing is, Jim is like I tell Jim all the time. I'm over. I'm an overeducated rock drummer, but you, but Jim's just has an amazing feel. Like he could sit down, he could turn on any song, and he could pop in there, and he could stay in there for the three and a half minutes. He's just decided that he doesn't. You know, he's not doing that for a living, so he takes the pressure off. Off. So when he goes and sits and plays the drums, it's just pure joy. He's not thinking, okay. My regret, more ended in two, my regret for not pursuing a musical career ended in 2008 when I met a gentleman named Rich Redmond. And I told you how hard it was. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm good. I, I, uh, I don't, I, I'm glad, kind of glad I didn't really pursue that career. Well, no, I was you know? telling him about the, you know, the, the maxed out credit cards and the, you know, eating ramen noodles and the, <laughs> yeah. all that, you know. Yeah. No, I, there is that. I did that for a good 15 years before we ever did anything so yeah you know, but what but what a story that. though i mean you know to, to kind of lay those foundations that that you know you guys were together you you and huey were together for a long time before it ever became a big thing you guys were in clover together as well correct no 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 not at all I was, okay i was not in clover clover i was in a band called sound hole here in marin That's and right. which johnny cola and mario Chiplina, our first bass player were in mm -hmm. and we're kind of the union of two bands so sean our keyboard player Sean Hopper and Huey were in Clover and the three of us were in Sound Hole and we were all pals because we all grew up in Mill Valley so we just it we quit everything we were doing matter of fact the day we put Huey Lewis and the News together and it wasn't even Huey Lewis and the News yet it was we I think we were calling ourselves uh the fools but um <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> but uh Every one of us was doing something else. Sean was in Montana filming a movie called Heaven's Gate. He was part of that movie up there. He was acting in it. He was oh, in Montana really? filming Heaven's Gate. Huey had, had, Clover had just broken up. Huey was delivering natural foods for a company <laughs> in San Rafael. Um, I had quit uh, a band I was playing in with Jack Cassidy from the Jeff Snare Plane. It was a punk band called SVT. I had just quit that band. Johnny Cola was playing with Sly Stone. He quit playing with Sly. Um, hmm. um, Mario was playing with It's a Beautiful Day, uh, doing gigs, and is playing with his brother, John Cipollina. And Chris Hayes was a guy who was playing with his sister, Bonnie Hayes, who's a very famous songwriter in her own right, wrote a bunch of hits for Bonnie Raitt and uh, some other people. And um, he, they were playing in a band together. And we decided all on the same day that we quit what we were doing and formed the group. And Why? you just went total commitment to it. Yeah. Complete commitment. Wow. And, and, and our manager, the guy who took us on as our manager, Bob Brown, said, I'll give you guys $100 a week. And that's what, you know, out of his pocket, he was, he was Pablo Cruz's manager at the time. Ah. And they, they'd had a few hits and he was doing well and he had some money and he said, I'm going to give each of you guys a hundred dollars a week to, um, to quit whatever it is you're doing and let's go. And there was probably a great feeling. You have to trust that, that gut, that intuition, like, Hey, this is man, everybody gets you along. Know? It, there's a lot of blind faith, as you well know, Rich, going into a, the music business. Yeah. That you have to think that you're the best, and you're the best band in the world, and you're going to make it by hook or by crook. You you're talented enough. You know people are going to come around and and love you eventually. It's all blind faith, you know. So that's what we had in spades. You know, we had a ton of that. We were very very sure that we were good enough 
to get by and we were writing a lot of good material at the time and yeah. we just we just had a sense that it was going to happen eventually and thank you thank yeah, you yeah. the big g <laughs> in the sky i you know i i'm thinking back you know when i got we got our little motorcycle gang of guys together um we were some cocky dudes we were we just it's i think it's a requirement for the first decade you absolutely know? we're the best were. fucking band in the world yeah and right. um anytime you're with another bill you know another band wrong. on a bill you're like we're gonna give we're doing a master class today guys <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> meanwhile we're like opening at four o'clock in the afternoon and the headliner plays at 11 p.m and we're like <laughs> master class guys these are gonna these guys are gonna be watching from the sides but that let's time, show them how it's done are you guys you ready it. for snack you, time you need it yeah <laughs> do you get do you ever look around and pinch yourself and say i have been able to mix business and pleasure at the highest levels i have been around the world with these gentlemen we all made our dreams come true that's gotta be a great feeling to still be making music with these guys decades later it's it's uh, I'm grateful for that every day I wake up and it's it's um yeah it, and more so every day I, it's it's when I think back on the career you know I, I tell friends of mine about things that I was able to do and people I was able to hang out with and meet and and they just look at me and they just shake their head you know yeah. it's like that they don't even sometimes they don't even believe me yeah right Right. Well, because because they're probably going back to the water cooler. And did you watch what the thing on Hulu last night? Yeah. Back back to the cubicle. Um, I I did the cubicle when I moved to Nashville. I had to make copies. I was a substitute teacher. I waited tables. I parked cars. I was like, just stick with this kid. Don't stop. You can do it. Uh, it's really special. It's rarefied air, and you know, to be no able question to, about it. Yeah, but to make it at the highest level, I mean. Let's just look. Let me just put on my uh, my readers. readers here. Yeah, uh, sports celebrating forty one years, I believe, and it's and it's just so relevant and played. Uh, uh, eighty four, so forty years this year. Yeah, forty. Yeah. Years. Well, actually, it came out in late eighty three, so forty one years. Yeah. I mean, right, incredible. Right. Three number one songs, seven certified platinum records, thirty seven thirty seven singles, six Grammy noms, one win. 19 top 10 singles across the billboard 100 ac and mainstream rock charts i mean that is a lot of stuff and then to be associated with uh, uh you know that back to the future movie i mean that thing just is the gift that just keeps on giving oh yeah. question incredible yeah. and now now they're actually you're in promo work for the the series ghosts because they're playing do you believe in love i saw that just the other yeah. day yeah, yeah, that's that's like whenever you see that stuff happen, I'm like, all those guys are like, "Hey, uh, like going to the mailbox again now." That's right. <laughs> hey, when, when you attain the age that I have, that mailbox money is very nice. You know, it's funny because I, I sit here in my studio. I don't have to work. You know, right. I'm the luckiest Good guy in the you. world. I'm a that's drummer. Weird. I don't have to worry about anything. You know what? How lucky am I? It's like the it's it's the the virtue of the path less traveled. A lot of people will take the risk of going into the music business. I took the risk of well, not really a risk. I went into radio, which was basically kind of like my um, living vicariously through musicians being in radio, right? So, but that afforded a lot of cool experiences as well for my wife and I as we came up. It was just, you know, didn't pay all that well. And now I'm kind of playing catch up. But it's one of those things that you look back and like, man, we've had a lot of cool experiences. A lot of them, you know. Yeah. And, and, those, and those, those are worth more than money. It really is. What a life, you know. And it's it, all the stuff that you guys have done. Not only that, you guys have, you know conquered the mountain of a very difficult business but rich and i you know he and i whenever we interview different people i always ask the question what music is being made now that we're going to be hearing in 30 40 years and go oh man remember you know what are the don't stop believings the power of loves the heart of rock and rolls are there songs like that being made right now and my brother my brother's a musician. He's been a keyboard player. He's the one who really kind of introduced me to you guys, uh, aside from like, you know, especially with four. Um, he's a huge Bruce Hornsby and the range fan. Oh yeah. Uh, anything with piano. Good buddy of ours, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's, uh, 
he's one of the he's a musical snob so uh anything that had you know uh distorted guitar was uh off limits but anything van halen 1984 and on he was a big fan of anything before that he was like yeah screw it i don't want it but right. uh, and it's it's just kind of funny but he and i talk about what's being written now that we're going to be singing in 40 years you know Man, I, I sure couldn't tell you one right i mean it's one of those things that you guys were a big part of that huge you know yeah. we just watched the documentary on we are the world the other day i have to do it still yeah dude that's kind of like great. you know huey being you know completely like oh my gosh i am just in a room of rooms oh that was that was I, a lot of people have been asking me about that lately because of that documentary you know yeah and, and they said oh, yeah. yeah we saw we saw you on the thing you were over the small in the corner smoking a cigarette you know yeah <laughs> and, and, it's and like, I, I am on you sang on it did you sing on it yeah oh that's amazing and the thing is, is that here you guys are here. I love the humility of Huey where, you know, it's like, dude, you can, you can be cocky. You've, you've done a lot of good, you know, amazing stuff by 1985. You know, you put yourself on the map, but he was still kind of like real hum, you know, uh, humble about it, which yeah. is very admirable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, uh, he was given Prince's line because Prince didn't was a no show. And some people have been saying that, oh, he, the, re the only reason Huey was there, Huey and the news were there was because Prince didn't show up. Well, that's not true. That's a, we were invited by Quincy weeks before the thing happened wow. because he knew we could all sing. And so he wanted, we were the only full band there. Yeah. There was no E Street band. There was no the rest of Journey. There was no the rest of Hall & Oates. There was no full bands except for Huey Lewis and the news. And we were all there. Well, That's cause you guys awesome. have the, those doo-wop chops, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah. your vocal. Quincy knew it and he, yeah. he dug it, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it was Tina there as well. I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. And here's the thing. We just saw Tina last night, the play at T-Pack. Oh yeah. It's like, gosh, it's, it was like what happened in, you know, the forties and fifties to create just a, musical wonderment that you know came to maturity in the 70s and 80s my goodness it, it's just it was just like what was it something in the water i mean <laughs> you know? think, was, was tina turner there i thought she was but it's funny because huey sang after michael jackson another feather yeah it's like yeah amazing yeah on that oh song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 there's some great stories from that night that uh, I, I was bet. i was down at, Hue at huey's uh the week before last in San Diego, I went down for a few days just to go play golf with him. I hadn't seen him in a long time. And so we went down to hang out. And, and uh, he was just telling, he, he'd just gone to the premiere on the previous Monday night in LA. Oh, for the Broadway play? <laughs> no, no, no. For the documentary, for the weird. Oh, the that's right. Okay. Yeah. And that's he right. showed up and he says, You know who was there? Me, Lionel Richie, and uh, this guy, Al Alan Klein, I think is his name the producer or uh, jeffrey klein or alan klein's somebody klein he said <laughs> nobody else nobody else was there oh it's just really odd you know wow. yeah it was a great well, documentary it's a yeah. well now i feel really bad that i uh, you know did not has haven't watched it bef before right. this interview. but yeah it's it's on Netflix. my to-do list i'm so excited hmm. about that is that how you guys warmed up backstage every night you just do a vocal warm-up that's exactly right yep we would sing uh, we would sing doo-wop stuff. We would sing, uh, you know, we started doing that stuff in, uh, after gigs in our hotel room when we'd have a party in, in our hotel rooms, you know, we'd go invite a bunch of people back from the gig and we'd all hang out until the wee hours and we'd sing. Yeah. We'd, we'd get wow. in the bathroom or the, you know, wherever we were, we just start singing and that's how we got it. Then we said, well, you know what? It sounds pretty good. We should throw it in the show. So we yeah. started doing a segment of our show acapella. Well, a singing drummer, I tell everybody, you got to have some sort of an angle, some sort of an additional skill to like it's make yourself limb. set yourself apart. You know what I yeah. mean? It, it's like whether like some, you know, some drummers in bands now are like one guy's like, yeah, you know, I do the booking or I manage, I take care of the social media and the website or I do the marketing. It, some, but the singing drummer, very, very good. I didn't get those pipes. Yeah. Like I can host a show, but I can't. Um, you're not gonna see me. He's a was everybody always picking on me. <laughs> You know, I'm just not going to be that guy. But so yeah. I have mad respect and jealousy for that skill set. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, thanks. That's that's you can thank my mom for that. You know, bless her heart. She was saying she sang every day, all day, you know, and, yeah. and taught us all those cool songs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
It's amazing to me because I mean, knows we, an ant can <laughs> move a rubber tree plant. Yeah, you know, <laughs> each thing all, and so we Rich, pick it all up. Rich had mentioned earlier that um, there are some tribute bands that are popping up. One in particular in the past ten years that they do an amazing job. We saw them at the Franklin Theater. Uh, they called the Heart of Rock and Roll, America's number one Huey Lewis and the News tribute band, and. Uh, you know, that's one of the things like I have a lot of tribute bands I'd love to be a part of when I get into my 50s and stuff like that. And you guys are certainly one of them because it's just fun music to play, you know, as you well know. Yeah. But as I sit down and I try to shake off the rust and start listening to the music, I'm like, this stuff is actually really challenging. <laughs> and one of the things I had the guys on, uh, Tony and Roger Langdon from the from the band, and they're huge fans of yours. They're actually really good friends with Sean. Sean was oh. at the show because he lives down here in Columbia, I think now. And uh, they which said, Sean are you talking about? Uh, Sean uh, uh, Hopper. Now, Sean he lives in Minneapolis. Well, for some reason, I thought he was in Columbia. They said he lived. I here was like, now. man, really? We got celebrities yeah. here. <laughs> no, Sean, they, they I mentioned. One, maybe I misheard it. I think one of the Humphreys McGee's guys lived down there. Oh yeah, yeah. Chris Chris Myers. Chris, 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 Chris yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. So He's basically, they said, uh, I was talking, I said, you know, one of the hardest songs to me is Stuck With You because of that just straight shuffle on the hi-hat. The and pretty they said, shuffle. you know, yeah. And that's actually one of the things he says, that's actually one of the, the songs we use to audition drummers with. I said, well, that's a good song. I said, the other one is Couple Days Off, which is yeah. another shuffle, which I wanted to ask you about. Was Alex Van Halen's Hot for Teacher an influence on that song? Because it's basically... No, not at all. Uh, not at all. No, no. Uh, uh, although I, I dug, I, I never really listened to that song very, very closely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, I liked what I liked what he did. I like what Van Halen did, but I, that song, um, no, that that wasn't the inspiration. It just, it, it just, that's what the song called for. I thought. Yeah. And, well, and, the, beautiful, and uh, the creative, beautiful thing is that you're doing it during the uh, the choruses on your feet, and then during the verses, you bring it up with a straight four on the floor yeah. with a shuffle of the snare. Right. Yeah, and then you're doing accents and hitting cymbals on offbeats and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there playing it, you know, and then I watched a video of you. You're actually shuffling with your right hand and then doing your snare hits with your left, and I'm going, that's how he's doing it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's just a, that's a like a rub shuffle on the snare drum. You yep. know, that's an old R and B deal. You know. Yeah. Some, some of those old R and B tunes. Well, I but I do I, have to, I I do have to say that these guys did want to uh, tell you something. We were talking about it. I for the first time in Rich Redmond show history, we have a clip that we're going to oh, play. All right, we need to do this more often. Oh, wow, cool. And it's from my podcast, the Mostly Middle Tennessee Business Podcast. Cheap plug, go check us out at mmtbp.com. Uh, these guys were on the last episode that's out, um, all about the Huey Lewis. So talking about tribute bands and stuff like that. Um, so here we go. We're kind of leading in with talking about Stuck With You, and then it plays on out. So here we go. Stuck With You. Stuck With You. Not right. an easy song to play as a it drummer. It isn't. Nope. That shuffle on the hi hat is you got to keep that tempo it's, going. It's one of our absolute audition songs if somebody yeah. wants to be a drummer. I said that if you can pull that feel, because even Huey himself said that was one of their toughest songs to get the feel because it's it's a lock in on during their shows. Yeah, yeah. and they play it all the time. They wrote it, which makes you want. So when you ask Bill, yeah, when you talk to Bill, first of all, tell him he's a phenomenal drummer, and we said so. Not that it matters. Yeah. But, <laughs> Why did you write it that way then? <laughs> <laughs> if it's so hard to lock it. But you know what? I love that. That's what I started to appreciate about them. So there you go. Well, you know, that song uh, was written by Chris Hayes, our guitar player. Yeah. And uh, we had just gotten off the road. Well, we were on the road co continually then. But we, um, Donald Fagan had just come out with his album, The Nightfly. Yeah. And IGY was the first track, right? And Chris wanted to, Chris just fell in love with that song, you know, and he wanted to write a tune with that feel. So he did. And that was stuck with you. So that, you know, that's, it, that's IGY, basically. That's mm -hmm. the feel of IGY. Yes. Mm -hmm. The, the Nightfly. Wow. That is classic. Oh, and the drum sounds on that record. So crisp, so clean, so perfect. Like your typical Steely Dan, it's like a science project. 
you know, where every front of house engineer in the world tunes their PA using a, a Steely Dan record, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Exactly. Well, speaking of drum sounds and the, these, this amazing body of work, did you guys have a producer that you carried through? Like, or was it, it was different on every record? Uh, our first album was produced by Bill Schnee, mm -hmm. um, the, our, our debut album. Uh, everything after that was produced by Huey Lewis and the News. You guys self-produced. Self-produced wow. all the way up until Four Chords and several years ago, which was produced by Stuart Levine, and mm -hmm. um, who, who had done the Crusaders and a bunch of people. He, Stuart's a brilliant guy. Yeah. He produced that record, but then we went back to produce our we, we produced every album except two. That's pretty wow. incredible and speaks to the, 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 you know, the ecosystem of your band and the, uh, the team spirit, because usually a producer is needed to intervene and to have the ability to veto and help get everybody out of their heads and get a 50,000 foot view. So that's pretty darn impressive. We, uh, we were pretty, we were very democratic about it all, you know, and, and, uh, it would take a quorum, you know, a majority to vote down somebody's idea. And, uh, um if you you had a few feel strongly cards you could play you know it's like no i'm sorry i am gonna have to i'm gonna play that fill right there i feel very strongly about it and uh i'm just gonna play it and that's the way it's gonna be yeah and you could do that once or twice a record you know otherwise you know but you couldn't you couldn't abuse that that uh card so do, but do yeah, you remember I mean, any of the fills that were that, that made it that were kind of fought over Oh, uh, sheesh. Nothing comes to mind? Nothing comes to mind, no, but I know it happened. Yeah. I know it happened several times. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and just arrangement ideas and stuff like that. And, you know, we arranged all this stuff ourselves, and everybody had a say. You know, everybody everybody had a – if you had a, an idea, a constructive idea, you free to offer it, you know, and that's just how we work. Yes. Now, the horn section, you guys don't always carry a horn section? How does that work? They were – not tower of power we since That's tower of power we have had a horn section right. wow nice. yeah and that was 85 84 yeah mm -hmm. 84 they started touring with us they were with us from 84 through 89 wow. and so then that was the thrill of a lifetime yeah you know, kicking those guys was what, what a what a what a thrill for a drummer are you, are you yeah. kidding me and and with your big band training, you knew just the right things to grab and just the right things to ignore. Right. Because you can't hit everything. Otherwise, the dancers get really angry. No, le less is more, you know. And when when I see these guys, the right hit at the right time, as, as any drummer like you guys know, the right hit at the right time is so more of, much more effective than some guy just symbols all the time you know i want I, I have another story for you i want to see john legend once and i don't know who his drummer is i don't want to dog him but but he ruined the show for me wow you know john's up there playing piano and singing the songs but this guy didn't play a straight beat for more than four bars yeah. everything had a fill everything had a crash i mean it was just it was obnoxious man i think and that's I, that new style that is that it's 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 expected in modern hip-hop r&b shows to have a drummer that can do the thing play linear fills forever and and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think you're right i wouldn't and, be the right guy for it i know that for a fact no neither would i by any would I. <laughs> but uh you know that that's just not that's not musical to me. Yeah. You, know, you when you're when you're playing the drums, you're playing a musical instrument. It's not just a noisemaker. You know, you have to play musically. Yes. And, and um, that's not music to me. That's just masturbation on the drums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Musical <laughs> masturbation. You hear, get off my lawn. Um, was there was there anybody in? And it does. It sounds like well, get off my lawn. Absolutely okay. a million percent. That's okay. <laughs> but, I own it. You want to know what? I own it big time, and it's true. It's That's just, fine. you know. I mean, you know, it's there's an element of dumbing down music these days. It's happening. I'll, I'll say it. 
But there's yeah. a uh, even like in the '80s, as you guys were really you know hitting your peak and everything, and everything you had all the all the hits that were coming out. Were there any contem- other contemporaries of yours that you really truly admired from afar, like an Alex Van Halen, maybe a Tommy Lee or a uh, Tico Torres or someone like that? Also, yeah, uh, yeah, Jeff Porcaro. Mm. Um, Jeff Porcaro, who who mm. ended up being a good buddy of mine. Nice. Um, uh, you know, what, guys that I really liked and admired were guys like um, Billy Cobham, sure. um, Dennis Chambers, yeah, uh, um, uh, Dave Weckl, you know, Vinny, guys like mm-hmm. that. Those were the guys who I thought were the 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 trendsetters. You know, right? Yes. Not not, and not not that I could ever play like any of them, but you know that they were just so tasteful when they played the song Mm -hmm. and then when it came to their turn to to show to showcase they were just freaking amazing watch out you know they were unhuman stuff as far as i could tell you know yeah but when it came to playing the song they could settle back in and play it just beautifully so that's what i admire yeah that's did you guys record back in the day back in the day you're recording a tape did you guys um record to click tracks it was that a thing that was seeping into the music business in 1983 or no yeah uh yeah yes we but it wasn't a click track i remember playing walking on a thin line right that song mm-hmm. thin line great it, song I, I i'm playing to a synth arpeggio arpeggiated synth so yeah. sean's holding a note and it's going gang 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 and he just held the note bang gang 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 you know and he kept it going through and that's what i played to that's where i got my click track from that's incredible and it was the same with harder rock and roll yeah oh wait a minute no 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 click track on hard rock and roll only thin line and there was no click track on any other song on that record Mm-hmm. And then what did you what guys use it? for the heartbeat? Was it like a sample of a heart or something? Or what was that? That was a, that's a lindrum. That's me on the kick drum of a lindrum. Boom, boom. Oh, wow. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and yeah. we overdubbed it. A, we overdubbed it a couple of times and doubled it up and detuned it once and, you know, detuned it again and it kind of nice. fattened out the sound. And yeah. Then, I love the, the lindrum that it had Indro. the... It had the the Jim the Lindrum had um it reminded me of like a like a car from the seventies had the wood paneling like a station wagon you know yeah. and then I ended up getting to meet Roger Lynn because in the early aughts um he had a box a stomp box called the Adrenaline and all yeah. guitar players would get these MIDI cables and would and it would lock to like my drum machine and then he could my guitar player 50 feet away on a 50 foot MIDI cable could stomp on the box and it would slice and dice you know to the uh, Elisa's box right sure pretty, pretty crazy and now all the crazy kids just do it with like modeling and uh, yeah. pro tools laptops and that, you know laptops yeah. yeah yeah so for a record like um, you know, 2020s Plan B or the Soulsville 2010. Did you guys do clicks to make editing easy and stuff? No, count it off. Let's go. Uh, uh, Soulsville was stone cold live. It had well, soul. We were at Arden <laughs> in Nash in Memphis. Memphis, nice. Yeah, we and and we, the band was in the big room, and the horn section was in another studio with a camera on me, so they could see me play, so they could play in time and there was zero click on that whole thing that's all live nice. very very few overdubs man your time and feel are from another time man it's like <laughs> it's it's impeccable impeccable and all your choices you know all the fills are i call them you know soccer they're soccer mom fills because they can play them on the dashboard they're very memorable they're hooky zap boom bop bada, spuz, baga, doom. Is good at, i mean straight from the motown playbook and the reason they work is because they work yeah but they're you yeah. know what i mean but you hey, have if they little, work then why, why wouldn't they work now i mean right. does get up boom i've probably played does get up boom thousands of times <laughs> and there'll be thousands more 
Right. You know, it's because okay. it, it just works. I think um, they're called money beats. Yeah, money beats and money yeah, fills. Money fills. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, just until re just until recently, I was play I played that fill all wrong, and I finally figured out how to play it. It's just a it's a six stroke roll. It's a six stroke roll, but it's a it's it's you know. Does get that goon? That goon. That's bop, bop, boom. Yeah. Mm. What were you yeah. doing? Like a like a five stroke road? I was just boom. doing like a buzz roll almost with my, you know, but, not but in, the, even in time. But the thing but is, when I, you say you're not trained, but yet there's some, you know, there's a song where it's like, uh, see what song is it? Is if this is it, you're like, got to do ba boom. You know, yeah. I mean, great. It's a good yeah. buzz roll, man. Well, I, I, yeah, it's a buzz roll. It's a double stroke buzz roll. Yeah, no. it, well, but that's the thing is, drum, on those you know, if, 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 even <clears> if you're <throat> untrained, you can figure <throat> that out and yeah. do play it. You know, I knew what that was. <laughs> that's killer. I, love, I just love the fact that the drums are always so big on those songs. Yeah, They're really I, up front. Yeah, uh, I never had to. I never had to bitch at the mix engineer to to get the drums up ever. Yeah, Not yep. once. I, as a matter of fact, there was many times when I'd say, "Can you pull that snare drum down a little bit?" You know, and that's not the drummers don't usually have to right. do that. No. <laughs> so no. yeah, that you know, and that's four album, which um, you know, stuck with you and hip to be square and all that stuff is on uh Jacob's Ladder. We call mm. Jacob's Ladder, we call that the snare that ate Cleveland, because it really is. It's freaking massive, man. It's oh. noxiously loud. And we want actually would like to go back and remix that album. Really? <laughs> and pull the drums down. Oh, it's, it's louder than the lead vocal. It's horrible. It sounds like a gunshot. It's a, the it got it's eclipsed crazy. by uh by Lars and the Metallica Black album cuz <laughs> his drum on there sounded like a shot like a 12 gauge going off. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, so many hits, man. Heart of Rock and Roll, Want to Be Drug, If This Is It, Power of Love, Do You Believe in Love, Heart and Soul, Hit Me Square, Back in Time. Buddy. I would say even the deep cuts, the the B sides are great songs. Yeah. You know, it's like I listen to uh, to um, sports. You know, eight nine years old, got the boombox. It was in my bedroom. It was a nice. I, I I'm I'm painting the picture because I remember the memory being cemented in my mind like a bookmark. Laying in bed, listening to these. I listened to that that cassette front to back. Nine yes. nine years old. You know what I mean? And it's like, for I'm you, impressed. Some, looking back on something like that, hearing that from me, how does that feel? You've impacted, you know, and influenced so many people, myself included, my brother. You know, what does that, what does that say to you? How do you, what's your commentary on that? Well, you know, it just adds to my gratitude, really. Um, you know, I, I've had so many people write letters to me personally and to the whole band, but to me personally saying, the song you wrote on that album, you know, I, I wrote some of these tunes, right? So the song you wrote, Forest for the Trees on the picture of this album, got me through chemotherapy. And I have and I have that I have you to thank for me beating cancer. Wow. wow. God. And okay. I've had uh, I've had several of those types of stuff. You got me through this period of my life. You did, you know, and it's just it's what it's it's it, it would be easy to kind of not to discount it, but just to kind of brush it off and say, yeah, that's cool and everything. But, yeah. but wow, you made a difference in someone's life. And that's really what we're trying to do. Right. Right. As right. human beings, we're trying, to move, people. We're trying to move people. We're trying to make a difference in their life for the better. Yeah. And so, even like the, guy, the guys who were in the tribute band that I played before their modus operandi is of course, do the best tribute to you guys you know, and they do an amazing job. If you ever get an opportunity to see them, I strongly suggest it. Yeah. They'd love to meet you. Um, but their modus operandi is to reintroduce the music to the vernacular of society. And I'm like, yeah, it really is. It, it's a music that's kind of like, you know, I'll ask people in business networking groups and tell them about me, you know, kind of sneaking my way into this band. And they go, who? And then like they're in their 20s. I said, Huey Lewis in the news. I said, and, and they're like, yeah, I've never heard of him. I go, but have you heard of this song? And they go, oh, I know that song. You know what I mean? Yeah, and well, yeah, that, I, I say that a lot to people. You know, they, 
you know, when you go to like a doctor appointment, maybe, and the girl checking you in is asking you a bunch of questions and she's in her 20s and says, what do you do, sir? I'm a musician. And then when you, as soon as you say I'm a musician, that piques oh. people's curiosity. Oh, oh, do you, do you play in a band? Yeah. What kind of music do you play? Well, it's kind of rock and roll, R&B, you know, it's a, oh, do you, do you play the band? Yeah. And now comes the other hundred questions. And, you know, and it says, what do is, do you play, is there anybody I would have heard of? I said, well, I don't know. Have you have ever heard of Huey Lewis on the news? And a lot of people nowadays, like you just said, no yeah. idea. Yeah, That's, no. Huh? Oh, God. You know, but, and then I say, have you ever seen the movie Back to the Future? Oh, yeah. I said, well, that's our music in it. Power of Love. Oh, I know that yeah. song, yeah. right? So that's that's where the door opens. Remember what, Remember the guy who told Marty he was being too loud? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my guy. Also, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, someone getting chopped up in the movie American Psycho to your music right. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come to, to the song I wrote. <laughs> That's amazing. See, now this is why you don't have to work, Bill. That's why you're just <laughs> sitting around on a Thursday in the middle of the afternoon, chetching. You um, guys just need like a TV show like Glee to reintroduce it to society like they did for Don't Stop Believing. Well, what's happening now, funny you mentioned that, we have a play opening on Broadway right? on April 19th called The Heart of Rock and Roll. All right. And it's, it's a, it's a, fictional story of a couple in love and he's trying to figure out whether he's going to leave his day gig and you know and or he's going to stick with the band or he's going to leave and do his day job so he can marry the girl and uh and it's our songs tie the story together right so I i'm hoping that a lot of people are going to be reintroduced to our music through this you know you know it's a work for mama mia right exactly you know? Yeah, it really did. I mean, it put ABBA back on the map. Yeah, so, so I hope it does it, for you because you guys deserve it. I mean, you you need to be reintroduced into well, society. That's, that's kind you of know. you. Thanks. It's and I it's it's from the bottom of my heart because you're a huge part of my you know musical landscape growing me up. Me too. Me too. You know, yeah, you're so, right there on the MTV with the police and the oh, Van yeah. Halen and you know, the, the, the MTV getting to the MTV videos. I mean. You know, every time a Huey Lewis and a news video came on, it was almost like seeing what we know nowadays as viral content. You know, what did they do now? Because it was always a funny video, very yeah. off the cuff, out of left field, goofy. Yeah. You guys cut up and have fun. And it's funny, the live videos, when I was, you know, impressionable eight, nine, ten year old kid, I'm like, it looks like these guys just got out of their day jobs and now they're playing a gig. <laughs> Right, they looked relatable. You just talked to them. They don't. You don't look like rocks, like t traditional rock stars. And that was Not great. At Not it at was all. Like, yeah, I just got on my job being an accountant for the day. Now I'm playing the drums. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I've been. A, I've been. I, I was asked once at backstage at a gig. Seriously, backstage at a gig. Some guy asked me if I was the band's accountant. Oh. <laughs> Can you do my taxes? <laughs> I said no. I was the asshole up there making noise. Well, I can count yourself lucky that you don't have to, you know, uh, cut your hair like this. And right. this, this is an overpriced haircut, man. I just got it done today. I was like, how much? And I got to do this every three weeks. You guys, oh, it's like God. you guys and Rush basically just, we're just going to do our thing. You know, we're going to buck the trends. We're not going to try and do a gimmicky thing. You know, Rush, they, they stuck to their guns for 40 years, built a huge following. And now, you know, Getty Lee's is like, I'm just, I'm just Getty, man. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, yeah. Alex is Alex. Neil was Neil. And yeah. that people admired him for it. I think the same kind of effect plays in this too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, uh, that was our, our, you know, kind of MO was keep our tongue firmly implanted in our cheek when we did the, all these videos, you know, yeah. make them funny. And, uh, you know, we were not going to be a political, we were going to be an apolitical band, yes. you know, uh, even though we all have our opinions, we were not going to be a, a U2, you know, we were just not going to do that. We were going right. to be a lighthearted, take your mind off your bullshit when you go see us, Amen. have a good time band. That's what we yeah. were going to be. And yeah. that's, and we succeeded. That's what you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I read something the other day. It said that the average person in their lifetime affects 80,000 people, whether in a good way or a bad way. So 
thinking about someone, Jim, think about like a like Bill, Bill Gibson. I mean, you all the music around the world several times, millions, millions and no, millions of billions. people you've affected in a positive way. And that's my mm -hmm. mantra. That's my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to affect people in a positive way and change lives. I wrote it down. As soon as I wrote it down, it came out of the ether. It got real. It got more real. And I started manifesting more things in my life that aligned with that purpose statement but just to, just think about that i mean that is incredible that's football stadiums full of people that you've affected oh yeah yeah that's right really really that's incredible. Right. And, and and all really not knowing we were doing it yeah. You know? yeah until until it started coming back to us yeah now speaking of that touring you know um i've done most i've been to like i think 20 countries um a lot of in and out you know let's fly to australia we're gonna play two shows and then be all jet lagged and then have to come back home. But you probably visited majority of the continent several times back in the day. Did you enjoy the international touring or were there some, like I got a sensitive stomach. So like if I spend time in like South America or India, it's not going to be the greatest time for me because I've got a really sensitive stomach, but tell me about your international. Uh, I, I, I loved every second of it. We, we, um, we spent a lot of time in Europe. Uh, we well, months on end we'd spend in Europe, and um, I I loved every second of it. I, awesome. I, I ate it up, man. I, I I don't have a sensitive stomach. I'm a foodie. I love all the different foods. Yeah. You know, I, I um I would love going to Japan. I just absolutely love it. Oh yeah, wow. And uh, um, South America was great. You know, I was a little more third world than I was expecting, but um, I should have known better. But <laughs> yeah, but uh, it was beautiful, and you know, the people were great, and I, I I loved every minute of it. I don't, I don't, I can't tell you a real bad experience overseas. I don't think amazing. Yeah, that is awesome. No, I've got a. I I like all the food too. I am a foodie. I just don't know how it's going to affect me, but uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> you know emodium baby yeah no yeah. i i keep the emodium lab in business <laughs> unfortunately i don't have any of those issues that's I'm great yeah. anything and i do yeah neither <laughs> do i fortunately because you uh, you are you are subjected to a whole new you know culinary deal when you when you travel you know yes oh, yeah. i can remember being in um finland once we were in helsinki and the and the Finnish record company took us out to dinner and uh, first they took us to a, a, a spa where we did the saunas and the, uh, you know, the cold plunge and all this stuff. It was fantastic. We loved it. And and now they take us to a restaurant and they, they're serving all this food and we, you know, kind of have to ask them what we're eating, you know, and they say, oh, yeah, now that's reindeer. Okay, okay, great. That's reindeer we're eating. And now the, uh, the, eating and then Rudolph. they serve. Then they say, yeah. <laughs> then they served some steaks, you know, and we go, oh, this is delicious steaks. What, you know, is this this is beef, right? No, 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 that's bear. You know, and so we were eating bear steaks, and wow. uh, so I mean, you're just getting stuff you you never find here, you know, and but it was delicious. I, I loved it all. <laughs> Thomas Lang told me a story one time because he goes to China all the time. He's almost like thomas lang is almost like uh tom cruise in china he's so there there's like giant billboards of the guy because they love drummers in china so he, he'll go over there and he's like he was the same thing people all of his uh people that hired him took him out to this beautiful fancy dinner at a however many star restaurant and he was just devouring this dish it was in this nice brown gravy and he devoured it and, he, and they said he loves the chicken eyeballs. Get him some more chicken eyeballs. He didn't know what he was eating, but he just was devouring these chicken. I and he's like, well, well, I love them, I guess. It's like oh, the, yeah. uh, the scene from Funny Farm with Chevy Chase where he's eating the uh, goat testicles. Yeah, oh, yeah. The sheep testicles. <laughs> that yeah. happened to us in Japan. We, yeah. we were in um, the record company over there. Took us to what they told us was the best Chinese restaurant in Japan. And then Tokyo was the top of a skyscraper. It was like 70 stories up, you know, overlooking Tokyo. Beautiful. And and and, and the, we were eating this stuff. And it's just clear, looks like noodles, clear noodles. And and we're thinking, oh, this is some kind of noodles, you know. And and, and our sound guy, um, Jimmy says, hey, um, what, what is it? What kind of noodles is this? And, and the guy says, oh, sea jerry. It's a sea jerry. 
see jerry he wants to see oh see jelly oh it's jellyfish oh okay we're mm. eating jellyfish so now we're eating jellyfish and now there's the thousand year old egg they pull out which is a quail egg that they bury for a while i don't know they they actually bury it in the ground and wow. it turns about 12 different colors very pretty <laughs> but it's you know it's discolored egg that you're eating whale egg yeah and that's all and then shark fin soup which is shark mm. fin in a soup it, it's just stuff you would never ever eat anywhere yeah. else. but yeah. um interesting <clears throat> for sure it's like the, the the guy who first tried an oyster you know who in the world in their right mind said you know what i'm gonna crack this thing open and eat it and yeah. eat it yeah. Eat what's inside of that. Sure. It looks yeah. like the stuff that comes out of my nose when I sneeze, but why not? Yeah. Let's try yeah. it. Yeah, it looks tasty. Yeah. And also, there's sure. the little fine print at the bottom of all those menus that say, enter at your own risk may cause extreme illness, <laughs> hospitalization, or death. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Put some Parmesan on there. <laughs> getting, getting back to the music, last night, uh, it reminded me of a story when we watched the Tina Broadway show. Uh, it reminded me of a um, in her documentary that they put out about two years ago or so. They talked about her first big breakout song when she was reinventing herself was What's Good Love Got to Do With It? And she was reticent to record it. She didn't want to do it. But she, I guess she heard the demos, and I think... Um, who uh, I think it was Olivia Newton John that was on on par to sing it, but you know they wanted Tina to do it, mm. and Tina was like, "Well, it just doesn't fit my voice. It's not powerful enough." And then she ended up doing it, and it became her big, her the best thing that ever happened to her. Right? Was there any of the songs that we know today that you guys were like, eh, I'm "Not sure if I really want to do it," and then all of a sudden it became huge? Yeah, heart and soul, really the one, the one that comes to mind. That was written by. Um, uh, Mike Chapman and Nikki Chin, and mm. uh, uh, it was had already been released as a single by the Bus Boys and Exile, the band Exile, yeah. who was Mike Chapman's band, had had it on one of their albums, and uh, they 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 pitched it to us. They said this song would be perfect for you guys, and um, so we worked it up, and we we're going, I don't know, I don't know, and um, you know, we heard the Bus Boys version and we thought well we think ours is better and we heard i, I loved exiles version i don't know if you've ever heard exiles but it was really mm -hmm. cool and we pinched some of their ideas for it and um actually by the time we got around to recording it for sports it we had made it our own and um and it came and it just came out great you know there there's some some songs we recorded that we had vision of it being a lot better than it actually turned out after you were done recording it and uh and it never made it never made it onto an album we thought well this for sure is going to be a great song but we just couldn't get it right wow. in the studio and then uh conversely there was songs that we didn't think were great when we were working them up in, in rehearsal and we go in and record it and it just everything came together and it was great yeah wow. interesting you know because our jason's uh manager uh started off in the business as exiles road manager i think he was like say sold t-shirts and then he became the stage manager and then became the ah. road manager and then now he's a manager a manager one of the most powerful music managers so doesn't matter what you're always working your way up yeah from yeah. the ground up oh, yeah. and one yeah. thing also don't ever forget you see the same people on the way down that you saw on the way up sure yeah, oh, yeah. so be kind to everyone why well, i, I don't there, see that of ever being a, being a problem with you because you are just a you're a smiley guy yeah, I'm 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 basically a happy man and and um yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Was there ever a missed opportunity for a potential duet with Huey and somebody else? Like again, I could imagine that if he and Tina ever hooked, you know, did a duet together, it would be a, an amazing thing. That would have uh, been Yeah, that would have been great. Been, right? Well, we did we did a duet with Winona mm. on on uh, one of our on Plan B. There's a duet with her. She sings with Huey. Nice. And it's called, I'm not in love yet. Mm -hmm. I'm working on it <laughs> that's very cool and jim remember we had huey we we had huey on episode 107 our friend right. our mutual friend chris cohen was nice to connect and he and he said um he will probably give you 30 minutes and he, we just all hit it off he gave us an hour we had a great time we did. but we you know um we were talking about you know his hearing issues um i'm assuming that there's no no touring no gotcha. he cannot Still. 
any full frequency sounds just turns into distortion for him uh -huh. so, and especially the low end if when you know and if the if music he can't hear hear music and that's the thing that that makes me so sad about it hmm. he cannot put on a record and listen to it he can't like one of his favorite albums and mine as well that both our fathers turned us on to when we were quite young his dad by the way was a frustrated jazz drummer as well his dad hmm. and my dad are very similar guys yeah and uh and I think that's part of the reason why he and I hit it off initially, you know, as as kids. But um, uh, where oh, shoot, where was I going with that? Oh, something about um, uh, a record that you and Huey both love. Oh yeah, so, uh, Frank Sinatra and Count Basie Orchestra live at the Sands. Irv it's Cutler. You, uh, yeah, and Quincy with a young Quincy Jones arranging. Yeah. Uh, no, it was um, it was. Um, Rufus Speedy Jones, I believe. I got you. Mm. If if or, or Sonny Payne, it was either Sonny or Rufus. Jeez. So and it, I don't know if you guys guys have ever heard that album. It's called Live at the Sands. It was recorded in '58, I think, mm -hmm. and it is one of the best live albums you've ever heard in your life. And it's one of Huey's favorites and mine as well. And he can't put that album on and listen to it because it sounds like he says it sounds like a jet engine to him. Wow. So. By virtue of that, he can't make out pitch. So he just can't sing. We've tried to. These are bone conduction headphones. Does he try those? Mm -hmm. He's tried. Still everything. the same thing? Everything. Really? He's, he's, he's tried. He's been to every ear hearing clinic in the United States and some wow. overseas. And he, he's, he's tried everything. There's the doctors just go. All uh, of them. Yeah. All the you ear know, doctors go. We don't know. This is something we just don't know. That's so I unfortunate. Didn't really, I didn't really know the uh, the persona of Huey until we interviewed him, and he's such a he's a sweet guy, very hu very humble. As a, I sensed a lot of humility from him, and it was actually kind of piled on. He did an amendment or an addendum, I guess, to the back behind the music that he did twenty some odd years ago. They re released it with him watching, uh, you know the the footage from the earlier version of it and he addressed the Meniere's disease and and his how he felt when they had you guys had to stop touring and i had to appreciate the fact that he was more concerned about putting everyone out of work <laughs> than his own yeah you know well-being yeah that's you know well i i was i was more concerned about him obviously but because right. he, he he had a he had a dark time there for about a year yeah <laughs> To that came down and and um and uh it was i had to do a lot of of um kind of you know boosted him up you yeah, know to yeah. just to just make sure he just didn't completely crash right, but he, right. he was he was up at his place in montana and he in you know he was just there was nobody else there and he couldn't hear and you know like 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 you said he was worried about uh, our entire crew and band and everything it was just you know it was 35 people that that were you know out of work yeah. and he was more worried about that than himself so that you're, you're right that, that that tells you a lot about the guy sure wow yeah. wow man that sure. brotherhood of a band comes together though that's good to have yep. you know that you guys were there to help him out and support him yeah yeah oh, man very very fortunate well, uh, Bill, we just what a pleasure. Uh, I want to just give a shout out to my dad because my dad, same way, would love the big bands, and he loved Gene Krupa, and he was just always so like, "You can do that, son." You know, and it was so encouraging. I think that he secretly wanted to do it, and he was like, "Let's get you lessons. You can go do what I didn't get to do." Because he became an account. He became an accountant. <laughs> so you, so, you, so you had that same encouragement from your parents that I did. Massive. Right? Yeah. And that and, and that when you're young is enough to 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 get you to to get that blind faith in you. Yes. You know, to go, I can do this. And I'm so gonna, saying I, I can just blame my parents then because they always told us that you got to have something. Hold on. You got to have something to fall back on, Jimmy. You can't you that uh, your music. You, you got to be in the right place at the right time and have a, my father would always say you got to have a gimmick. You know, but here you go into the phone business and go to college and told my brother and I that my brother to this day, he's in his 50, I think he's 50, a little bit younger. I think, yeah, 53. And he, um, 
He's like, I always still hear dad in the back of my head going, you need something to fall back on. I'm like, but dude, on his deathbed, he told you he regretted telling you that. And now he knows you would have made something. And it's like, damn it, just do it now. You got the resources. You got a yeah. legal uh, law degree. Come down to Nashville and combine the superpowers and, you know, do it, man. Jim, and I hope your brother listens to the show, man, because you're always. Oh, dude, I've told him, Tom, I'm freaking <laughs> blue in the damn face. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the black sheep in the family. I'm the one who, you know, took the path less traveled yep. and did the radio thing and it's yeah. paid off, you know? So yeah, man, creative yeah. pursuits, creative pursuits. Yeah. Well, Bill, we love you. This, it was so special for, uh, for us to spend this time together. We usually end the show with the, the fave five. I'm going to ask you your fave five or things, favorite color. Blue. All right, you got the blue shirt on there, blue pearl snap. Go. Love it. Favorite food or dish? That's hard. Uh, He's, a foodie. He's a foodie. Drum roll. That yeah, that's so that's subjective. a tough one for me, man. Yeah. I, I I like it all. Yeah. Marin County, a lot of good sushi, man. A lot of good sushi, a lot of good everything. San Francisco, everything. oh, incredible. Hey, um, would you? After living in California, being a California boy, boy all these years, would you ever entertain living anywhere else? No. I, you know, <laughs> Jim knows how much I love California. It is like, I tell you what. Um, favorite you drink? You live in New York? No. Favorite drink? Mm -hmm. uh, it, when I was drinking, it was a Myers and OJ. I haven't, I don't drink, so, but, you know, it was Myers and OJ. Is that was Myers, my favorite. What's what was Myers like a gin or a vodka? What's Myers? No, Myers is rum. It's a dark rum. Oh my god! So oh, wow. in the in the early Myers, days Myers. of touring, your little drink next to you was rum and orange juice. It was the band drink. I never drank when I played. Nice. Never. Uh, but it was the band drink. Yeah. When did you give up the 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 hooch? Ooh. Well, oh, see, that's good. You can't remember. Can't remember. See, that's good. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. Long time. Long time. I love it. Um, favorite. This is hard. Uh, Jim doesn't like this question because it is so hard. But it's a song. It. What is your favorite song? If this thing comes on the radio, no matter what, where you are, you're going to crank this thing up. Now that's that's hard, isn't it? It's yes. a tough one because it's so subjective uh -oh. and seasonal. It favorite song oh my god that's like saying what's your favorite painting you know yeah uh, the scream well what's oh, your favorite song at the moment it's, it favorite song in the moment probably is a song that my daughter's doing called stargazing nice, nice. i'm working on it today and you're producing your daughter's it's killing me well i'm helping her i'm not really producing her but i i'm putting some um, keyboard tracks on a song that I wrote for her. So nice. Incredible. And then what about your favorite movie, favorite film? Uh, 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 uh probably. Mm, wow. That's another one. That's I got a favorite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We get a lot of Shawshank Redemption, you know, uh, Pulp Fiction, Jaws. Back to the future. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. None of those. No, I, I, I would say something like it's a mad, 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 mad world. Nice. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Black and white? No, it was color. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was a pretty funny movie. Nice. I like comedies. Do you, nice. do you, do you binge all the Netflix comedians? Like, there's you so bet. many specials. I've seen them all. Like, I'll, I'll turn it on and say, maybe somebody's got a new special. And, my current favorite comedian is Jim Gaffigan. He's clean he's and great. he's prolific. Yeah, he's and, great. And you can rewatch his stuff and get the same laughs. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's a real talent to to have a tight, nonstop laughing, poignant hour of material every well, two years. The new uh, the new Curb Your Enthusiasm is has just dropped and uh it's uh, we w <laughs> my gal and i watched the latest episode last night and it's great i i, I, I love all the verbs oh god I, larry david I, and i love the fact that it's brilliant. quasi it's improv it's um, improvisational in the sense that it's look at we got to get from point a to point b but how we get there i don't care and that right. is amazing because i took a year of my life i studied improv comedy in los angeles and it oh, is cool. frightening i just wanted to in my midlife, I wanted to get away from the drums, Bill, and just try something different that was creative. And um, 
kudos to any improvisational actor that can get something from point A to point B and make it look effortless. Wow. Woo. It's intense. Yeah. So do you like to be found on the World Wide Web? Do you have a website or a... Uh, I don't personally, the band does. And I, I, I can be, I can be, um, um, contacted through the band's website. Okay. Um, Huey Lewis and the news.com. And there's a, there's a, if, if you want to ask anything, Bill's available to answer. <laughs> I love that. I oh, yeah. love that. Well, yeah. Bill, thank you so much. This was a long overdue conversation. I hadn't seen you in like eight years. I'm glad. I know, you know, I, I was going to say, I, I really enjoyed meeting you that night in Nashville. And, and I, I would hope we'd had a chance to talk longer, but it was, it was a short, quick deal. And, but I enjoyed meeting you and I've, I've, I've been a fan of you guys. And oh, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate great, it. Great man. to talk with you guys both. Man, Absolutely, thanks man. so much for being here. And, uh, you know, hey, I realized th the hard way, I got your cell phone number. I can send you weird memes. You can send me anything you want at any time. I love it. I mean, thanks so much I, for I being here. I don't have here. his cell phone number. I got, so yours, I I got yours as well. So <laughs> watch what you send. Yeah, yeah. Send me, <laughs> send, send me the weird stuff. Uh, Jim, thank you as always, buddy. And I know this was a special time for you because you're such a fan. You know? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Very, very killer. And to all the listeners out there, thank you so much for your support. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And until then, see you next time. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, guys. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.